very much. I haven't ever operated in the round before, and I'll probably do it very badly. So apologies right now to this group. <laughs> this group are going to do OK. One of the reasons for that is, unfortunately, my iPad has frozen, and I'm left back into text territory. Um, I wanted you to see that film, because I thought it was remarkable. But also because 20 years ago, when Stephen and Heppel started, and it was almost just under 20 years ago, and Stephen Heppel and I started doing events like this and talking about the things that, frankly, not that different from what we've been talking about today. Um, a, I don't think any, either of us would have believed that we would have achieved so little in that length of time. But um, more importantly, that was exactly the kind of exercise that I had in mind that schools would do, you know, that a teacher would give the kids uh, an exercise. Do something, you, you, you do something for the, about the nativity, we do it in a new way, an interesting way. I would love it. The only problem with that film is it wasn't made by school. I think it would be quite fantastic if a school or a number of schools had, had uh, pitched in and, and done that. Uh, just to show also how flexible I am, you know, just in the iPad, I've been reading this Bertrand Russell book, 1932, this was written. I just thought I'd read one sentence, longest sentence to you, because it has everything to do with, I think, in a way, what I want to talk about. 1932. There is no reason to suppose that the state will ever place the interests of the child before its own interests. We have, therefore, to inquire whether there is any possibility of a state whose interests, where education is concerned, will be approximately identical with those of the child. And I think it's fair to say that uh, it was a good question to ask then, and the short answer is that, no, it hasn't yet happened. There is not yet a state where there is an absolute confluence of interest between what's best for the child and what's best for the state. I left school as fast as I could when I was 16 because no one ever bothered to ask me what I wanted to do with my life, and I knew very well that if ever I asked them, the answer would be something I didn't want to listen, listen to. Uh, I then went, subsequently went to night school and created my own curriculum, and I'm sure as hell is why I think I'm standing here today. It's also true to say that I left the film industry 15 years ago because I felt the film industry had ceased to be adventurous within the digital world, uh, and I felt that possibly more could be achieved in the area of public policy and education than could be achieved in the film industry. I'm sad to say that, in fairness, I was wrong. The film industry has done very well. It's moved very quickly. When you actually look at the extraordinary uh, uptake of 3D and the amazing, amazing work uh, at Pixar, for example, the film industry has adapted and adjusted very well to the digital world, far faster, far more effectively than I would suggest the world of education. So that's where, in a sense, I'm, I'm coming from. I mentioned that Stephen and I started 20 years ago. Now, during those past 20 years, a very significant amount of money has been invested in technology to improve the quality of learning in our schools and universities. And many successful suppliers of educational technology have for some time been able to point to convincing evidence of the value of this public investment in their products. But my argument today will revolve around a belief that we've barely begun to explore the ways in which technology could really transform education, and with it, the life and career prospects of literally millions of children and young people. Here in this country, where there is remarkably little manufacturing to speak of, and fewer and fewer young people dream of whiling away their entire lives working in an office, the creative digital and information technology economy remains among the fastest growing amongst any of the Western nations. Indeed, recent research from Nesta once again shows that the UK creative and digital economy is growing at least 5% faster than any other aspect of this country's economy at a time when growth and jobs are most sorely needed. Now, by chance, when I was preparing for what I was going to say this afternoon, I came across a rather damning recent report from PricewaterhouseCooper, which focused on Britain's comparative failure to compete as a serious exporter of products and services to the emerging economies, certainly as compared to many of our more obvious competitors. And the PwC report concludes with these words, there will be scope for Western firms to exploit the growth of populations with more money to spend, pharmaceuticals, financial services, and education are sectors with significant potential growth for Britain. Now, I have no doubt whatsoever that PwC are right. And I'm only one among many who've been shouting from the rooftops for many more years than I care to remember that education could very easily become one of the most powerful drivers of growth, both internally and externally, that exists in this modern and highly competitive world. And just as an aside, 
how much more dignified would it be to earn our living as a nation through education in preference to financial services? A great deal safer too, probably. But here we hit the first paradox. Our coalition government does indeed call for growth from UK PLC, but where on earth will the talent come from to, to drive that growth when there would seem to be a pretty fundamental division of opinion within government about the role and the significance of technology and learning? Let me flesh that assertion out slightly more fully. On the one hand, and I'm sorry this is slightly Anglo-centric, but I'll move off of that in a moment, the Department for Culture, Media and Sport and the Department for Business, Innovation and Skills would appear to be culling the very type of disruptive innovation and the nurturing of exactly the type of talent that's most likely to feed the future growth of the UK. And at the same time, the Department of Education gives the impression of, culling, of calling sorry, for a return to some form of back-to-basic style of learning, which may or may not include Latin, but certainly includes the names and dates of the kings and queens of England. Now, I'd normally have no argument with that, but the department has accidentally or possibly even deliberately managed to convey the impression that these strategies are in some sense an alternative to developing the kind of learning which builds on those modern technologies that are part and parcel of the everyday lives of most young people in the form of smartphones, media players and game consoles. It's also worth mentioning that during the course of the many years I've been making these arguments, these affordable yet powerful platforms and technologies have also become embedded in the everyday lives of a whole new generation of teachers. So in a sense, the argument is quite different from 20 years ago when Stephen and I were talking to quite befuddled generation of school teachers. Those teachers are no longer befuddled. In fact, they're part and parcel of, they're in fact digital natives. Now, during a week in which the BET exhibition at Olympia is bigger and more internationally significant than it's ever been with 70 education ministers, or education ministers from 70 countries present in London tonight, it seems entirely appropriate to ask, how on earth did we get ourselves into this mess? Now, in a sense, we're talking about two very different approaches to technology. The first approach seems to be designed to support and reinforce existing, or I believe outdated, teaching practices, some of which haven't materially changed since the Victorian era. It's a little like putting the man with the red flag back in front of each automobile, but allowing him to jog a little more quickly. Merely digitising old practices means that you're simply seeking to get much the same result, but faster. And therein lies the problem. If all you do with technology is use it to support existing methodologies and existing practices, then why, then why and on what basis would you even expect new or better results for improved learning? Let's consider instead what a major positive disruption in learning and teaching might look like. What would a digital curriculum look like rather than a digitised curriculum? We need to start by looking at what's happening outside of the world of traditional education, where disruption is already having a powerful effect, led, of course, by the internet and the exponential growth and development of just about every form of digital technology. Take the iPhone or iPad, for example. Apple didn't invent the phone or the tablet computer. They simply, and in my judgment, rather brilliantly reimagined them, and as a consequence, changed the face of the mobile phone, computing, and software industries forever. And this process of change is gathering pace all the time. Just last week, as many of you will know, at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, literally scores of devices, including tablets, were unveiled by a host of different manufacturers, most of them perfectly capable of developing into what we might describe as learning applications. Soon, we're told, Apple will launch a second generation of iPads, this time with a webcam built in, allowing video calls over Skype and other forms of video conferencing, and who knows, maybe even Flash. <laughs> the, the iPhone disrupted the mobile industry business model for distribution of content and software, giving birth to a mobile app economy that's fundamentally changed the way in which the world acquires and uses software. So thanks to devices developed by Apple, Google, and others, People are no, long, no longer so much as hold their phone to their ear as actually operate it with their hands. And this isn't just a Western phenomenon. With 5.5 billion mobile connections today, expected to rise to 50 billion by 2020, mobile technology is close to reaching just about every single human being on Earth. And this will in turn have significant impact on the way in which society operates, all the way from government to healthcare and onto the manner in which we socialise, communicate, play, work and, yes, even learn. So where, oh where, is the specific disruption 
that will forever change the way in which we learn. When will we apply the same 21st century thinking that's disrupting every other part of global society to the seemingly insulated, or is it isolated, world of learning? When will we recognize the very rich, deep, and valuable learning experiences that young people are gaining when they create and edit a video, share, a, a video for sharing on YouTube, when they collaborate with thousands of others in, a, in virtual worlds, and when they participate in creating a new Wikipedia page? Surely our job is to build on those learning opportunities, adopt, enhance, and even transform them to a point at which they satisfy all of our criteria for what qualifies as a learning experience. I'm sure Jimmy Wells will have a lot more to say on this subject a little later. So unless I've missed something, these are exactly the type of skills that young people are going to need if they're to compete or even enjoy life in the 21st century. But he goes well beyond the issue of competition. Surely these are also the skills and the drivers that can motivate young people to embrace a love of creativity, science, technology, engineering and maths, the very things that allow them to have knowledgeable and fulfilling lives. Not only, I believe, is this the worst possible moment to abandon the adoption of technology within learning, it is precisely the right moment to begin a renewed discussion about the role of technology within learning and how we might best embrace those platforms that are already embedded within the daily lives of most, if not all, of our young people. It's time we moved well beyond the notion of ICT being principally about what does and doesn't work on an old-style PC. We've got to start thinking about what the world's likely to look like when those children who are now entering education move on into the world of work in 2025 and 2030. The time's come, no, in fact, the time is well overdue to reboot their education system and ensure that it's genuinely fit for their purposes and ours. Because let's not kid ourselves. If we in this country fail to get our act together, very few tears will be shed amongst those more courageous or adventurous nations who already have. The next multi-billion dollar business to emerge from this period of intense disruption may well be, I think, in the field of learning. And some of the people driving those businesses may indeed be sitting in this very room right now. In fact, with all this change in mind, it's probably time we started talking seriously about the productivity of education, as well as its effectiveness. As I find it increasingly hard to see how we're going to improve on the one without the other. What's certain is that if the world of state education fails to grasp this opportunity, then we're simply opening the door for the private sector to step in and show us how to. And given my background and my political prejudices, that is not a development that I view with any kind of equanimity. But to avoid that, we are all going to have to revisit our prejudices and, where necessary, our budgets, and learn to make the actual time spent in school a lot more interesting and that much more productive. Imagine a world in which you could begin to put together a whole set of new ways to organise learning, to share information, to produce knowledge, to assess achievement, to provide feedback, in fact, to devise entirely new forms of what I would call learning voyages. I believe we'd better, because I see nothing but very rough seas ahead. And what if all these developments taken together had the effect of allowing the average number of months spent by a young person in school to be actually reduced? Now, surely this is where the case for technology helping skilled teachers to deliver by monitoring and ensuring that time actually spent in school is as efficient and as effective as it can be will really begin to bite. Increased productivity of this type would allow many of the present economic assumptions to be revisited. This could possibly result in higher and, dare I suggest, more graduated pay for teachers. This in turn might encourage a greater willingness on the part of prospective teachers and school managements to invest more intelligently or at least more assiduously in professional development. And it doesn't require a great deal of imagination to believe that with higher productivity, higher skills and higher wages, the teaching profession itself could enjoy an entirely new era of prestige and fulfilment. Having recently completed my, completed my seven years as president of UNICEF here in the UK, when I speak of a more imaginative future, it is very much the global stage that I have in mind. That means finding ways of significantly improving the situation for students in the developing world, because not to do so can only stunt the process of development and risk exacerbating the educational divide that already exists between different nations and regions with all the social and ec economic consequences that will necessarily flow from that. This morning at the QE2 conference centre, Michael Barber showed a wonderfully dramatic uh, 
slide showing how the incidence of civil war among nations with advanced educational systems dropped dramatically over those with poor and underperforming education systems. Just that alone is a, a remarkable thing to, to dwell on. And it's also, not least is this important, because many of the countries in which educational attainment is poor also, tragically, happen to be the, among those most likely to be affected by the earliest consequences of climate change. Now, allow me to draw on a recent experience from my former world, that of cinema, to illustrate the degree to which I think we are failing to seriously come to terms with the future. A little over a month ago, I was in Australia, chairing the jury at the annual Asia Pacific Film Awards. I mention this because in a period of just nine days, I watched 31 of the most remarkable movies to have emerged from that large and increasingly significant region in the past year. And in respect to the title of this session, I'd argue that filmmakers are particularly good at sniffing out the social and cultural zeitgeist, resulting in what we then come to, to refer to as trends. And one overwhelming trend that emerged from watching these movies from 15 different countries, 46 nations actually submitted nominations, was the issue of what I can only describe as intergenerational alienation. The young no longer trust us to do right by them. And they have a serious problem believing many of the things we say. As they see it, we've stolen their pensions, their food and water security, their future job prospects, and their environment. And now we have WikiLeaks as if to prove them right in their suspicion that the dominant players in the political and commercial world don't even know how to play with a straight bat. Now, there are those who will claim that the intergenerational world has always been typified by suspicion and mutual misunderstanding, to which my response is that never before in history have we been to the same degree living in each other's pockets, both metaphorically and in reality, aware that a crisis in one part of the world has the capacity to utterly overwhelm those living elsewhere. No, the realities and the challenges facing the young today are not those of the 19th or even the late 20th century. We may not have woken up to that fact, but literally millions of young people already have, and they don't like what they see. While going online has given people more opportunities to talk to each other, young people in particular have less time or less inclination to listen to what we might term corporate speak. In this increasingly sceptical, if democratic, online world, you can't get through simply by speaking down to people or shouting that bit louder. No, you need to earn respect for your place in the world. It is dialogue that makes online connections really work. And of course, this new audience, especially the young, expect speedy access to the material of their choice. They expect to be active participants in shaping the narrative and to share their opinions about topics of interest or concern. And remember, an online conversation is not just a two-way affair. It's networked, potentially to participants all across the globe. If we're to win back the trust of young people, we need to engage effectively with their world. We need to learn to view technology through their eyes and see it as transformative, not simply as some kind of add-on, but something that changes the very core of the way that we, and certainly they, live and, live and learn. We need to urgently focus on winning back their trust and respect, because without it, the chances of our being able to help them develop the wisdom, the patience, and the courage to deal with the world that we bequeath to them moves from being difficult to being well-nigh impossible. I'd argue that no matter how gifted or charismatic you may be, you will never successfully influence or teach anyone who doesn't trust and respect you. With that thought in mind, I'd like to conclude by just quickly reassessing what I see as the crucial lessons all of us ought to have absorbed from the past 20 years, if we're to think our way through to the type of societies that we'd wish to see emerge in that ever more difficult world that I've fairly consistently referred to. Firstly, like it or not, getting our education systems right is not just one among a number of social priorities. Education is far closer to being the whole ball of wax for every nation on earth. Secondly, no education system can ever be better than the quality of the teachers it employs and the constantly improving standards that it requires of them. Thirdly, teacher training in a digital age has to be viewed as an entirely non-negotiable and continuing process. The commitment of governments, businesses and educational professionals to the best possible quality of training, along with regular, preferably annual, paid time out for professional development must become absolute. And finally, there needs to be an undisputed national and global acceptance 
of the importance of the education of women. As I discovered during those years with UNICEF, women are the fulcrum around which can be built educated and healthy families. And those families will invariably be smaller and better cared for. Now, there's absolutely no magic in any of this. The reality is that a world-class education system can, over time, deliver the economic underpinning for world-class health services and sustainable pensions, whereas the reverse can never, ever, ever be true. The good news is there are excellent people in this room, across the UK and far beyond, who instinctively understand that education at every level will be both the cause and the consequence of any possibility of regional, national or global renewal. The challenge for us is this. We have to become far, far more persuasive in getting our message across. Thank you very much for listening to me.